visual iconography um, to sort of um, play about with um, the kind of way we live in cities today. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to have Chef 360. Evening, everybody. Can, does that sound all right at the back and everything? Okay, well, um, nice to see so many people here. It's also very strange to be here because uh, I've been coming to these lectures for God knows how long, and to be on the other side is quite nerve wracking. Um, but I guess I'd better just get going. Um, all my work takes as a starting point um, visual kind of media culture in a broader field and say just restricted to a kind of art world bubble. And I really believe that it's kind of quite important to break out of um, that kind of limited visual field to take on board a uh, kind of broader scope of references that now exist in the sort of cultural marketplace, um, of which art is just one part. Taking your scarf. My scarf getting away, so I feel, feel nervous without it though. Um, I've been trying to get a kind of punchline to kind of underline uh, the kind of main reason for uh, raising death behind my work for a while. And I happened to just be reading um, in a book the other day, and somebody seemed to kind of put it really well for me. So I'm just going to pop that up. Um, so, go and read that. Because all my work deals with um, my background as kind of. Um, an Asian growing up, born in uh, London, growing up in Britain. And so it's kind of this point of kind of culture, cultural intersection that's kind of the trajectory for a lot of my work. Um, but it wasn't so much kind of an idea of, of race in and of itself that kind of interested me. It was more the kind of construction of race. And it's really there where it says it's the imagery of race that is in play that kind of is a real point of departure because it's really about a set of constructs. I was just chatting to someone earlier today and uh, trying to talk about kind of role models when you're growing up. I remember as a kid, you know, um, I couldn't be James Bond when we sort of played games at school because of them being the wrong skin colour. And it was this kind of lack of role models. And then, you know, you, you kind of felt yourself lucky when Saeed Jaffrey came along on telly, um, even though that was kind of a million miles away from who you might be. Obviously, that's changed a lot since then. But even still, it's still representations and, Im you know, image constructs that kind of dictate the way we kind of perceive um, individuals um, as a kind of construct rather than as just that, individuals. Um, are the slides ready to go? It'd be nice to get an image up. Oh, we're going to another quote. Um, basically, a lot of, most of my work uh, takes takes on board the format of the sort of billboard campaign that you're the ones used to in pretty much every urban metropolis around the world these days. Um, for me, the kind of interesting facet of the billboard was it kind of, it went beyond mere sort of surface image and went into kind of, for me, created notions of debt in and around the city as well, and therefore was a quite a good um, kind of construct with which to deal with uh, kind of constructs of race, um, culture, etc. Can you get out of focus a bit? Is that the problem? I was about to, but don't worry. I'll do that in a sec. It's not working at the edges, is it? No. Maybe if you took it down a bit. Anyway, this is... Um, Probably this is my first piece as Shares 360, um, which you can ask me the name, you can ask me more about at the end if you want. Um, it's called Boys Who Hold Hands, and it's from 1998, and was really about putting um, Indian street portraiture into the format of a Gap campaign. I don't know if any of you have um, seen the exhibition, um, photographic exhibition a few years ago that was part of the Shoreditch Biennale called Street Dreams. Um, which was examining this kind of notion of uh, street portraiture in, in Asia. And in most parts of the Asian subcontinent, you have these kind of uh, roadside photo booths for people to kind of go and live out their, their kind of vernacular fantasies. Um, and also, quite a, quite big in this iconography is men holding hands, which is also kind of, you know, if you go kind of west of a certain point in Europe, it's kind of quite a normal thing. And in fact, the suggestion of homosexuality would be kind of reacted to with kind of alarm and probably violence. 
um, whatever that's saying is kind of another kind of worms. But it was kind of just trying to posit that kind of east-west differential and kind of reclaim something from the um, multiculturalism, recent sort of slew of multiculturalism in the ad world, kind of return it to a, sort of what I call a culturalism. Um, something on these lines, I'm just going to pop that up. It's kind of going through my head. Sorry, I'm in the way. I don't see that. And there was this idea of kind of things being bright and clean and, um, and therefore not being dismissed. And the kind of almost white racial purity of the background of, say, Benetton and Gap campaigns on which you then got posited as the contextualized subject that became an interesting point of intersection and kind of possible reclamation for me as an artist. Um, if we go jump onto the next slide, I don't think we'll start getting that one focused. Basically, this is one of the images from that Street Dreams exhibition I was mentioning a minute ago. Um, they all kind of, I don't know if you can make this out just yet, but they all kind of take the form of uh, these kind of painted lurid backdrops, which kind of um, suggest a kind of fantasy sort of, uh, or a fantasy or kind of another another realm, a kind of utopia in a kind of in a kind of different formal way, but in a very similar conceptual way to say a Gap or a Benetton campaign, um, sort of white background suggesting a kind of you know, de-racialized utopia, which is kind of, a, a kind of quite a suspect notion. Backdrop features this very good looking, kind of uh, very kind of pale Indian guy in kind of neat 70s style suit posed by a Mercedes, and she's kind of right up next to the background, kind of pretending she's got her arm around him. And it's that kind of really gives you an idea of, kind of the vernacular function of this sort of portraiture. Um, if we jump to the next one, please. And that's another one showing the bike. I mean, the bike I used in the piece is uh, India's number one selling bike. Uh, so CB100. So uh, I, I try and kind of be quite specific with the details. They're quite important, I think, if you're trying to sort of suggest something, whether people get that or not. It's kind of quite important for it to be there. It's kind of a history within the picture. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a piece from 99. It's called Bungra Muffins. Um, and it's, you know, it's the main kind of surface object was that kind of humorous function of, of, of the term bungalow muffins, pairing it with they're eating um, sausage and egg muffins from McDonald's. So looking at how kind of terms like that, a Victorian kind of uh, consumable kind of becomes um, appropriated by a sort of multinational for its particular target market of Britain. Um, for me, it was also exploring kind of ideas and modes of difference um, in that a lot of Asian kids and various other sort of um, say non-black others have taken on kind of black culture as a kind of mode of difference uh, within urban inner cities. Um, hence the term Bangra muffins out of the kind of 80s notion of ragamuffins in terms of black street kids. Um, and the problematics that go hand in hand with that in terms of visibility and representation. Um, this is not kind of the ideal Asian kid even as viewed within the Asian community. You know, they're, they're not lawyers, they're not doctors. And it's kind of that kind of transition into a kind of more expanded field. But for actually being young and Asian, um, it's a difficulty I had to face myself sort of becoming an artist, because that was kind of a departure from that mold. And obviously that various other factors come into play from out of that. Um, you know, the Asian community itself is kind of in denial about, um, about Asian youth crimes, about Asian youth drug problems, and 
and by trying to sort of make make that sort of section of their own culture disappear, it's become a sort of self-censorship. Um, in trying to keep to kind of uh, a, a nice sort of imperial um, or, or colonial notion of what Asians should be within uh, British culture. Um, we go to the next one. Um, this is it on show, just to give you an idea of how um, my works work in the gallery. For me, it's quite. Um, I quite like this kind of play between public and private space. Um, a billboard on the high street would seem like a sort of public um, sculptural work to a degree, but yet it's obviously um, part and parcel of private enterprise. And so taking some, but then you've got this kind of second reaction of taking something that's kind of pseudo public but private back into the sort of private space of the gallery. And yet there, for me, that kind of is a point of accessibility to a wider audience because it's something people are familiar with. I can relate to quite instantaneously in terms of image culture, and and accessibility is quite important. It's one of the also the reasons I've chosen kind of um, advertising culture as my sort of broad visual reference is because it does have that kind of um, immediacy. Um, next, please. Um, this is just to show you that uh, Bangra Muffins was originally commissioned by the White Chapel. And uh, two days after the show opened there, this poster went up in the, in the Burger King just next door just to show the kind of flip side of corporate kind of assimilation of, kind of cultures of difference as a form of profit. Um, and a lot of people were just asking me how I knew, and it was just a, a weird stroke of faith. Um, next. And this is one of my favorite works. It's called uh, The Party, and it's based on um, Peter Sellers' film from the 60s, um, where Peter Sellers plays this Indian actor who's, who's very endearing but very inept and accident prone and accidentally blows up this Hollywood film set. And he's put on a list to be a black ball from Hollywood, but accidentally gets in invited to this kind of very shishi Hollywood party. Um, and I should probably show you a bit of the film before I talk any more about this. Um, can you cue the first video, please? Doing well with technology tonight. Um, I guess I'll talk a bit more about the piece then. Um, basically, well, a bit more about the film. Um, the film, the party, is kind of quite interesting because, kind of, quite a quite a while after the sort of black and white minstrel show, you've got Peter Sellers kind of browning up to play the part of this Indian actor. And what was very strange for me growing up was that this film was actually very, very popular in Asian households. I grew up just only seeing it in Asian households. And being very, very young, I actually believed in the kind of makeup and took Peter Sellers to be Asian. I kind of felt it to be a kind of wider satire on, on Hollywood and, and Western values kind of bound up with the notion of, of Hollywood kind of uh, wealthy parties. Anyone want to stretch their legs for a minute? <laughs> um, it kind of spoils the flow, but I can for a bit. Um, 
Yeah, basically what interested me um, in this film that we can't see at the moment um, <laughs> is the kind of uh, double-edged stereotyping in that something which kind of fitted obviously into what one would normally sort of criticise for its kind of uh, almost sort of pseudo-racist use of makeup or whatever was actually taken on board uh, by the Asian community. Um, in fact, it was kind of the piece was quite a personal one because it was very much bound up with my kind of um, dawning awareness that I was kind of Asian and different because it was it was like when I realised that Peter Sellers was wearing makeup that it kind of that kind of weird psychoanalytic self kind of conscious self consciousness came came forth um, and kind of uh, nothing's ever been quite the same since. Um, it's very hard talking about the film that I've shown. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't sound kind of too off tangent, but um, It's, it's, you've rewound it. I had a cue. Um, if you fast forward it for about a few minutes, otherwise you're going to get. Uh, sorry, what's, what's it on the counter? No counter. Really. Was that where it started from? Find it a couple of minutes. I'm sorry for testing your patience like this late on a Friday. Very impressed that no one's walked out yet.
That's it. No. I, uh, I never touch it, thank you. Well, I'm on a diet, but to hell with it. <laughs> okay, can we get the slides? Oh, we've got it back already. Um, <laughs> I got that sick assignment. Um, basically, what, what kind of interested me with the film um, was that kind of double-edged stereotyping of it, a stereo, you know, a kind of objectified uh, Western cultural objectification of, of, of Asians, and also a self-stereotyping of Asians so readily identified with it. Um, for me, what also kind of became interesting is, in terms of that kind of what I've said before about my own kind of uh, subjective uh, construction of an idea of myself as kind of different, um, this kind of it fits into kind of Lacan's kind of a kind of circular mapping of, of um, a concept of the other as always being kind of defined and produced um, for a kind of other who takes on a kind of a, a power position as kind of different and, and kind of above you, but, but that kind of could go on endlessly. And what interests me in the film is as much as he's kind of other because of his uh, of supposedly being Indian, um, there's also the social awkwardness that comes with a kind of idea of masks and self-representation in that way, which kind of ties it into a, a kind of broader psychoanalytic definition. Um, does everyone know <coughs> that? Um, the piece, basically, is also one of my favourites because I just feel very cheeky whenever I look at it. Um, I actually used five male models from uh, Models 1 and frowned them all up for the part. Um, and all the suits came from Savile Row, so there was almost a kind of idea of taking on a kind of um, a fashionable and a fashionable kind of uh, um, mainstream elite of British culture. So that was quite amusing. But what I've tried to do with it is, I mean, the guy, I don't know if you can see, but the guy at either end is actually the same guy, so I wanted that book in effect. And I've tried to sort of reproduce some of the kind of mannerisms that are taken on board by Peter Sellers in the film to suggest Indianness, but also to suggest awkwardness. And, and that kind of idea of being sort of uncomfortable in one's own skin and how that might tie into an idea of um, a kind of psychoanalytic other. Um, I can go on now, next. This is a shot of it um, with uh, Peter Sellers in one of the scenes you've just seen. Um, this was at a show with the British Council in Hamburg. Um, it was in 99 as well. Um, next. Um, this is a David Hockney painting. Um, it's called Rocky Mountains and Tired Indians. And um, I think it was, yeah, last summer I was asked um, to do a piece for the facade of the Royal College of Art, you know, with that kind of, yeah, 2000 summer show. Um, and, you know, Hockney being the kind of most famous and venerated product, I kind of couldn't resist the urge to kind of to mess around with Hockney. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of a direct pastiche of this painting we kind of build into it um, a kind of idea of Indians in like two twin hemispheres. You know, the fact that we still operate from what was the from Columbus's mistake um, 500 years ago um, in terms of the kind of anthropological naming, and that kind of for me lends the light on sort any sort of anthropology or ethnography or social history that's kind of been produced since then. Um, um, what also kind of on a more personal note kind of interested me is this kind of notion that as a kid, I was never allowed to be a cowboy when I kind of played with friends. I was always an Indian, and it's just kind of like, well, um, um, well, you know, which stage removed it? Am I an Indian? Um, you can work on the slide now. Next one. And this is kind of what I did to it. Um, the piece is originally kind of looking at the, the kind of sufferings of the Native American Indians. Um, and the kind of in the original painting, you, you had this uh, a blue chair on the right, which is a kind of uh, visual pun on being them being tired. 
um, basically what I've done is kind of reduced the landscape to a kind of commodified plastic sheet um, and um, exchanged the uh, Native American Indian girl for an Asian girl in a sari, which is my idea of looking at this kind of, um, kind of the fact that you've got Indians in the East and the Western Hemispheres, and also what's kind of often written out in the history books is the very similar uh, policies of dividing rule that were kind of applied to both both groups, admittedly in the kind of um, North American example, it kind of goes a bit further into full-on genocide, but that's kind of not really any different from the kind of more kind of polite British version of it. Um, also, just to kind of take a piss at the Royal College a bit more, the chair at the bottom right was by Ron Arad as well, just to kind of, um, you know, chuck in an in-house in, in joke again. Um, what was also interesting about the piece was um, all the landscapes were kind of um, their Playmobil sets, and I managed to get Playmobil to sponsor it as well, because it's quite important for me to kind of implicate um, corporations where I can in, in my work in whatever way or form um, as the kind of um, bodies that kind of create these constructs or propagate them um, in contemporary kind of currency. Um, next slide. And that's it. Um, sorry if I thought you more to there. Um, that's it on the front of the Royal College. It was about, um, I'm trying to remember how big it was. I think it's about 30 foot across by about uh, 15 foot high. Um, next. Um, this was me trying something a bit different. This was for a show in Frankfurt. Um, for some reason, my work keeps seeming to be exported to Germany. And the only reason I can think of for this is that I'm kind of a safe ethnicity and they know they've got my return flight home rather than actually giving kind of space to Turkish artists and galleries. Um, what I was trying to do for this show was just to try something different. Um, and it was my way of kind of bringing in some Turkish people into the gallery, albeit as kind of the kind of menials, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but I wanted to try doing a billboard performance. This kind of billboard uh, backing was kind of in place. And during the kind of private view of the gallery, the, um, the image was pasted up. Um, if you go through the next ones, we've had a couple of second intervals just get the process. Well, these guys are the most fun people at the private view, really, but it's kind of understandable in Germany. And one more. Yeah, it's got there. Um, yeah, they kind of say they had a drink afterwards. And, and um, Ah, this is kind of, uh, I guess, the um, the end bit of my talk, because um, I guess the main kind of point of interest is um, a billboard project that I did in the uh, East London borough of Tower Hamlets um, last September. Uh, for me, um, it's kind of... Um, my granddad had originally kind of come over here and he was kind of, um, he kind of grew, he kind of spent his life in Brick Lane and, and that was kind of a point of kind of, uh, point of emigration um, to, uh, immigration, sorry, to Britain. Um, but what was kind of interesting to me was the kind of recent um, kind of hype and fashionability that kind of was going on around, um, around the borough and basically all again on the kind of point of sale of, of multiculturalism and how wonderfully trendy and multicultural it was. And for me the kind of daily daily kind of practice daily existence in Brick Lane was kind of nothing like that. It's kind of about as segregated as you get, even with all the kind of you know white friendly kids and still the kind of Asian street kids. They don't drink in the same bars, they don't of course walk on the same side of the street. Um, <coughs> this was kind of particularly apparent when I was I was down there at the kind of quite horrible vibe bar having a drink with some friends. Um, it kind of became quite aware because a bunch of Asian kind of kids who were kind of obviously from the nearby state walked in and it was kind of like that moment in American Werewolf in London at that pub on the moors when everyone kind of stops and stares. Um, and it was kind of something, this kind of um, realization that I was an acceptable Asian was kind of really kind of very uncomfortable for me. Um, and what I also wanted to look at was kind of how the notions of migration within an odd space of the city um, can then be kind of taken up as a point of kind of um, as a point of marketing by kind of the state agents and developers, and how in that redevelopment, um, sort of multiculturalism is used as a, as a as a way of kind of hyping a place, but obviously with the with the knowledge that 
actually moving that particular kind of ethnic grouping out. Um, what I was kind of um, thinking about this, um, there was an interesting thing I came across, um, which was looking at the way in which um, cities and their kind of ethnic quarters are constructed. Um, and this is quite an interesting passage I found. quite interesting that kind of Whitechapel, which for so long had been a kind of, um, well, have been through various transitions from a ghetto of the kind of working class poor and the kind of, which you see represented in Hogarth's images, through to kind of being a kind of a later Jewish ghetto and then latterly a kind of Bangladeshi ghetto. Um, how it was kind of constructed as this kind of aside, and obviously you've got this notion of zoning within cities where kind of bits are kind of left to be forgotten. Um, but then obviously with, with the urban spread um, and the need for space, these things are kind of recommodified and packaged um, all at the expense generally of, of the kind of denizens of the zone. Um, basically what I took was quite a, quite a kind of, what some of you might think is kind of quite a visibly literal starting point. Um, and being a borough of Tower Hamlets, I just wanted to make it an Asian Hamlet. I mean, that was kind of a nice kind of one-liner that kind of could then tease out some of the kind of underlying notions of migration that I wanted to put in there. Um, for me, the kind of central trope is the fact that you've got Hamlet, which is a play about the Prince of Denmark, being penned by an Elizabethan Englishman, and then why not kind of just take it one step further and introduce a kind of Asian equivalent to this. Um, at the time, I, I don't know if any of you have seen about, in the sort of few six months building up to September, I kept seeing billboards everywhere with kind of just normal white Hamlet figures. And so there seemed to be a kind of currency to the image um, in some form of kind of um, commercial iconography. Um, if you go through the next three, basically these were kind of, I had uh, four billboards um, allocated to me. and. What I wanted to do was just have this kind of repetition. Each of the figure is kind of from one pose to the next, either mirrored or rotated, to play with this idea of virtuality and, and kind of uh, visual reproduction. And for me, it was also quite interesting to have um, within the kind of spatial dynamic of what is kind of a, a very strongly Asian community, an Asian figure represented. Um, Again, in, in the notion of zoning, you've got sort of large-scale advertising is mainly directed at passing traffic. Again, another way of kind of ignoring the uh, populace of the zone, as it were. Um, there were some other kind of notions going into the uh, production of, of the kind of billboards within the space of the city. And um, there's um, a quote here by Miller Laverman Akikelis, who does a lot of public artwork talking about a project he did. I don't think it was necessary to actually include any details of the project, but it was quite interesting because I felt that um, in terms of the previous quote and that idea of dirt and immigration, that he should then use a mapping process of, kind of the sanitation department and how these different kind of um, forms of mapping around the city and in terms of public art can occur at different levels. And this is something I'm going to come back to in a minute. What I actually did was to um, try and, um, this is a map of the project. Um, what I wanted to do was to have the four billboards um, almost forming a kind of a 
visual panorama as well uh, to play with kind of that sort of Victorian device of the panopticon as kind of being a kind of uh, endless pictorial space <laughs> and kind of put, kind of impose that on the space of the city itself. Um, what, how, how much that was kind of taken in by spectators was just in my own head. I, I don't, I'm not going to lay claim to, but uh, that was kind of the intention. These four, I mean, there wasn't anything as kind of complex as kind of figuring out the sanitation process of Whitechapel area, but um, it did involve kind of a bizarre uh, set of stints working with the people. All the sites were done by, well, who's the, uh, I can't even remember now who the local people were. Um, they weren't very nice. Maiden, yeah. Maiden, Maiden, but thanks. Um, and I had to have all these sort of arguments with them. They wanted to know what I was doing, and they weren't very helpful at all. And it was only just kind of through sheer kind of persistence that it kind of came off in the end. I mean, there were moments when I thought the whole thing was going to be go down the toilet. Um, but after spending, after finally getting them to agree to it, I ended up spending sort of endless days, you know, looking at kind of all these code numbers, which are kind of the strategic targeting of, of different spaces of the city according to population age, uh, sexual kind of preferences they've got. You believe there's, there's kind of gay, gay kind of couple of streets and there's a kind of straight couple of streets, just like literally next door to each other, you know, so people know about this. Um, but it's really kind of interesting the specificity to which they take it down to, and eventually I must say it was just trying to get this kind of panorama feel kind of like that, um, according to what was available and what kind of fitted within the budget of the project, but also I mean, initially one of the suggestions mooted was just to have an endless set of hamlets on the kind of main main strip in Whitechapel High Street. But for me, it was kind of much more important to have this kind of one actually really kind of um, interacting with with what I thought was the actual space of that city. So a lot of them are kind of off the kind of main road and kind of fit into the local community, so they'd be passing them. Um, I think we go to uh, the next slide. Um, this is one of them. Um, I don't know if I should bother pointing out where it is on the map, maybe I should. Um, this one is that one. Um, which is kind of somehow turned out to be the first one. I can't say that it was all that master plan. Um, next. Um, this is number two, which was where the milk board did me a fantastic favour. This one's here. Um, I, I barely even need to explain it. I mean, I was there at six in the morning watching these go up, and that one went up first, and I was just, my jaw was like, literally, I was having to scrape it off the floor. Um, I couldn't believe it, and it was just so fantastic that mine was kind of positioned above it, giving it the kind of, uh, in terms of visual hierarchy, a kind of point of superiority, and that the graphic design of them were kind of an inversion of each other. Um, and that's about all I can say on that, because I still, and this was another case, pretty much like the burger thing a bit ago, that people were just like, how did you know? How did you figure that out? And I was just like, how, how do you, you know, how was I supposed to figure that out? It was just an act, you know, act of God, um, if you pardon the expression. Um, next, please. Um, it made me think of this piece. Um, I'd like to chuck in a couple of references. Now. This is by General Idea from their, uh, from their pavilion um, in Basel in uh, 79, which is a piece called Nazi Milk. Uh, which made me think about the kind of white background in terms of notions of purity and, that, and the milk kind of threw up this notion of, of whiteness and kind of made me go back into the kind of whole notion of the background that I was using. Um, but really I just put it in there because I like it and it goes really nicely with the previous one. Um, next please. Um, this was another point of interest, kind of this idea of mapping the city comes out. This was actually um, after the project, I didn't really realize this until much later, but you can see there's a Globe estate agents right just up the road from um, billboard number three, just here, um, which was, again, somebody wandering around afterwards, taking somebody around, I saw and was just kind of, oh my God, there's another kind of point of intersection. There's all these kind of weird notions of mapping that kind of, I think, occur as soon as you're entering the space of the city rather than just confined to the gallery. It really um, takes things out into a much broader context. Um, next, please. Um, another one of that one. Um, next. And then on the walk between that one and number four was sort of Tower Hamlet's one stop shop, which was kind of um, a nice, this one I did sort of plan because it was just quite nice that people going in to cash their gyros, whatever, would, would be part walking between two of the billboards. Um, 
and hopefully kind of um, questioning it in whatever way that they might want to question it. You know, kind of um, nothing kind of put forward. And um, next one, please, is the uh, announcement for. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, you can stop with the slides for a minute and put on um, video number two. <laughs> that's not going to cause a complete breakdown. Um, you can cue that one from the beginning. Um, I should tell you all that I haven't actually seen this video yet. This was just a little bit of documentation around the project that my assistant kind of edited for me to pick up at about six o'clock. Um, yeah,
big. But that'd be fine to put your ideas down. Um, Spread you to sort of write down if you can, like why, why the billboard I've done is different from any normal billboard. The whole idea of it being so English is kind of rubbish. And then the fact when people go, oh, it's so English, you're so Asian. What's that? What's that mean? You know, so that's what I'm trying to say a bit with that. I don't know how it, how, what do you think about that? It's quite good. I mean, I've almost got nothing to say at this one, which is why I keep, why I've been taking people to the other one first. It's kind of, it kind of makes my point better than I've made it alone. What's your message? Sorry? What's your message? My message? Um, you know, perfect juxtaposition. Yeah. I was standing right there, actually, at six in the morning on Saturday, watching it go up. And they put up the, um, the white stuff first. And I watched this last and then the text slowly emerge and was just literally moved back into tears. Why are you made of it as well? Oh, that's exactly. It's just kind of made me to put it more badly and it could make mine better. Um, Yeah, I'm happy to take a few questions, but I do need the loo in a bit. So, you've got to take your chance now. Um, I'll turn this off, sorry, it's wet in my eyes. Um, can you get a light on? Well, maybe I'll start this off. Um, is there, do you think you kind of touched on it during the talk, but is there a difference between showing your work in, say, Stuttgart and showing it in London? And oh, it's in oh very really definitely. To deal with? I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a weird one because you know, I'd often, I mean, often, especially with work, say, with, like, Bungra Muffins, I'd always thought that very London-specific. Um, and I'd sort of expressed my concern before about my work travelling to Germany in particular. But what was very interesting was uh, when Bungra Muffins travelled to Berlin, uh, the gallery it was shown was in a kind of Turkish district. And I was actually really surprised. All these Turkish people came down to see it and kind of really related to it. And what I thought was a very London-centric piece uh, kind of filtered out because it was very si there was very similar kind of adoption of black street culture going on with this kind of Turkish kind of underground in Berlin, um, and so that was kind of the upside of kind of the uh, downside of put about a minute, a few minutes ago. Anyone else? Yeah, at the back. Um, it was really. Um, do you want the pre-prepared answer or the honest one? The honest one was really just, um, it was sitting around drunk one night um, and trying to sort of move away from the typical position of kind of um, a Western artist and the kind of self-referential kind of cycle that goes with that. And, and really it just got to the point, in com you know when conversations get really overly simplistic um, and it just, we just sort of figured that the surname was to blame and settled on that as kind of the victim of our sort of night's terror and um, sort of thinking about it more and more over time, um, kind of the 360 became a kind of, it kind of played a kind of very close line to that whole ad speak that I'm kind of referencing, and this kind of a jokey kind of um, riposte of kind of globalism or multiculturalism that was becoming much more current in advertising. Um, so really it's coming from, from that really, so there you go. Um, 
projects I'm working on now were simpler. Moving towards is a bit more difficult. Um, projects I'm working on now, I'm doing, um, I've got a solo show um, coming up soon um, and in London, and I'm doing a project in Birmingham later in the year, which is kind of quite interesting. It's dealing with, there's a very big um, photo and a photography museum which has an archive over there, which relates specifically to immigration um, and both kind of blacks and Asians into the Birmingham area um, in the 50s. Um, and kind of we're asked to look at the kind of space between the texts that go with these images and the images themselves to look at a kind of construction of race and immigration. So that's probably the most exciting one that's coming up. And then there's a few other kind of regular kind of arty shows which you, you do. Um, anything else? several times, I must say, um, a lot of it's to do with the fact that although we're kind of trying to present a universal, it, it does come from a very sub subjective position of myself as a male body, um, and yes, I do kind of worry that the only kind of female image I've shown is, is the kind of one of a pair in the sort of Thai Indians. Um, the solo show that's coming up actually features a, a female image as a central one, but it's very difficult, I think, um, because although I might kind of move from it, there's a subjective starting point. To even by even by using kind of the female figure, not to kind of render it a kind of a very basic cipher, but then there's that kind of also extends to all my work because kind of all the people become ciphers. The use of models, the use of styling, all becomes a set of ciphers and codes. Um, so I think it's a difficult difficult area. Um, it's something I worried about before. The fact that I've now got a solo show going up with a with a female figure as a central piece, it's kind of less bugging me. And actually, a lot of the works I'm moving back to are kind of more to do with the male figure because um, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I guess if there's one more comment. Uh, how, uh, how would your work be different, uh, for instance, with the work that, uh, that uh, the police could prevent it? Yeah, that's an interesting one, and that's one I'm posed quite often. I think um, the really kind of, more kind of, maybe slightly off the subject, but the answer is probably that I've been approached, I was offered a one-year job contract by Benetton and latterly by French Connection, um, uh, both of which I've turned down, and I'd say that kind of marks the difference. And also, if I go back to my point earlier about kind of reappropriating culturalism, that for me kind of marks out a difference as well, and the fact that there is no kind of tangible product. Also within my kind of, there is kind of no logo except for it's a kind of corporate logo kind of subverted within my work. Um, and one thing I kind of find that um, that I kind of uh, worked with, but has kind of come back to me, is the fact that I, uh, there's an absence of text in my work. That's quite important for me because I've just through lots of kind of research, literally just wandering around the street and asking people questions and pretending to be a TV journalist or whatever. Um, the fact that I've, I've come to find that it's often the text that renders the reading of advertising very passive, and it's actually the absence of text uh, that causes people to stop. Although that kind of can break down as well. Um, there was a very interesting point, I don't know if it was late on the video about the billboard project, but I was there like wandering around by the billboards just pretending I was again a TV journalist, it's something I do quite often. Um, maybe it's a career I miss. Um, but and I just stopped um, an Asian guy who was walking past and I said, uh, what do you make of this? And he was like, well it's shit, isn't it? You don't know what it's advertising. And for me that kind of made my point uh, kind of full circle. So does that answer your question? Anymore, or I guess we can we can move up to the bar now. Um, well, time. just before we end, can you put on just one more slide in the carousel? It's be difficult. I'd just like to thank you all very much for coming, and um, please feel free to come to the launch of my solo show that's coming up. That's the information for you if, if you've got your diary. So I've got a few spare invites with me, but I'm certainly not enough to go around. But. Um, I hate formality on the door at my shows, so so please come and bring any friends, and and that's a kind of uh, sneak image of it. Um, I'll leave a bunch of these up here if anybody would like one. So that's it. Thanks, Jess, again.
Yeah. I'm high and see that high. Yeah. This meeting. Happy days. Good.